right, uh, before I saw this car, I wanted to run through a couple things while I have it here. Uh, yes, sadly, it does seem this is going to a new home soon. I know I mentioned in one of the last videos I wanted to do a diesel conversion on it. Uh, and then shortly after that, somebody made me an offer that I don't think I'm going to be able to refuse. So while we've got it here, let's, uh, I want to talk about what it takes to convert a CIS 8 valve Mark 1 into a carbureted 8 valve. Uh, similar applies to 16 valves, but we won't get into that. That's not even a Mark, well, it is Mark 1 Scirocco motor, but it's a bit more involved. These can be done very, very easily and very, very affordably. Um, it's not super cheap, but it is and can, well, not is, but it can be a lot cheaper than trying to fix and sort through an old, broken, questionable condition CIS system. So, unfortunately, we don't have a CIS system on here, but we should still be able to run through it. Now, first and foremost, before we dive into exactly what you need to do to convert from CIS to CARB, um, the things that will make your life a whole lot easier if you're not buying just a single 3236 um, Weber off the shelf and bolting it on you're gonna need to do some tuning especially if you're buying and use the unknown condition carburetor off somebody or you're gonna rebuild it this mainly applies well this applies especially to race carbs get yourself a wideband gauge the air to fuel ratio gauge you know whichever you want to call it um, just do yourself a favor and get that because otherwise the only other way to tool, tune these is via the butt dyno or taking the spark plugs out and checking how they're burning and then taking it out for joy rides 57 times in a row up and down the neighborhood um get yourself a wide band it will make your life so much easier and that's how you tune a carburetor like a gentleman the other thing i would strongly recommend getting um fuel pressure regulator and fuel pressure gauge those two things you're gonna want. It's gonna make your life easier. And uh, otherwise you're just kind of waving your dick around in the dark. So get those things, work like a gentleman. Um, I'll put a link down below of the wideband that I used. Uh, it's an AEM analog gauge. It looks at place in the late Westies. I can't say the same for these uh, early cars, but it's an analog gauge, not big, bright, flashy lights in your face. I hate that. You're obviously ditching the stock air box, which would sit somewhere here. And on top of this stock air box, you will have your fuel distributor, which is where all your fuel lines come off of. You have your four fuel lines running to the head. Um, and then the fifth fuel line warm-up injector would run to the side of the intake manifold here. So it's pretty straightforward with removing all of that. Uh, if you're going to try to remove it to sell it, you know, obviously take everything off carefully. Rip your airbox off, rip off the uh, associated lines, you know, your main intake tube. Um, sometimes you'll have uh, some other stuff coming off the airbox uh, if everything's intact. But basically disconnect and remove the airbox with the fuel lines. And those you can simply remove by using a pair of channel locks if you don't have the actual tool to remove the injectors but basically if you get a pair of channel locks on here and wiggle the injectors out they just pop right out um and then the fifth injector is just held on with a big banjo bolt break that bolt loose pop that fifth injector off um we've got a bunch of vacuum lines too Near, near the top of your airbox, you're gonna have like a big can with one of the fuel lines coming off of it. Again, banjo bolts. Uh, you'll have your feed and return lines sitting on top of the airbox. So once you remove your fuel lines off the airbox, you go ahead and come down here to your actual feed, your feed and return hard lines that are attached to the car. These run to the fuel tank. Um, you'll need to plug up your return line unless you're gonna use it. Some carburetors, you don't need to use it. I'm not having any issues that tell me I need to run one on this setup, uh, but sometimes you'll get fuel overflow or the carburetor will load up on too much fuel even though your jetting's correct, and that can be due to overpressure. These uh, single Webers are happiest with three to four PSI, and I know I have exactly that running to it. Um, ideally, get yourself a fuel pressure regulator on here so you know for sure 
uh, that's what you're getting at all times. Um, fuel pressure regulator to end a gauge. Now, I just cut these lines down here. To do this a bit neater, you can cut them all the way down here at the bottom of the firewall. You can see them running back here. You can see those lines running back at the bottom of the firewall there. Um, and that would eliminate a lot of unnecessary lines. I don't mind having the extra hoses and the clutter under here for the sake of not totally ruining the hard lines to the car in case I do want to go back to fuel injected or whatever have you. Uh, but if you want to do this a bit cleaner, you do need to cut those fuel lines down closer. You can run the fuel lines up here and bring it over there. But once the fuel lines are addressed, you can move on to removing your intake manifold. Real straightforward, should be a couple of bolts. Uh, I think it's six or so bolts holding the intake manifold on. Remove that, get rid of it, throw it in the garbage, sell it, do whatever you want to do. And then when it comes time, before you bolt on the Weber stuff, you do need to sort out how you're going to plug up your injector holes. Now you would leave the regular fuel injector cups in there. It's hard to see, but the factory um, injector cups are in here still. Now the cheapest way to go about this is you throw dimes or nickels down in there and seal them up with silicone and you're ready to go. I know Tectonics Tuning sells like a plug kit, but eh, you could do it with some pocket change and a, and a bottle of RTV. So this works just fine. You're not seeing a lot of pressure in there. You're only gonna see vacuum. And if you're seeing pressure through there, you got some stuff going on that shouldn't be going on. As long as you do a good job sealing that up with RTV, you're good to go. Plenty of people have done it. I've done it on more serious motor builds than this one. Uh, so seal those up, then you're ready to rock. Simply bolt on your Weber manifold and your carburetor. And you're good to go there. Um, in terms of wiring, there's not much you really have to alter. Uh, again, same thing with the fuel lines. I didn't want to go altering too much, uh, making any permanent changes to the car, um, even though some of this stuff is trashed. So this stuff is just related to the CIS, which is fine to leave in the bay. Same thing as the fuel lines. If you want something a bit tidier, obviously cut your CIS stuff off and ditch it. Uh, you've got your coil up here with a couple wires running to it. Shouldn't have to alter any of that. Um, on the later cars, you have an ICM and bracket that sits up here with a big plug going into like a trapezoid shaped blah, blah, blah. Um, a plug going to that. And that's for your later haul style. Later distributors. Like I said, this is an early point, so I've just got one wire to it. But uh, again, you don't have to mess with any of that. You know, at the very least, you just disconnect your CIS stuff and toss it off to the side. Everything should still fire up just the same. You shouldn't have any issues with spark. If you do, then obviously something's broken with up here with your um, coil and ICM, if you do have an ICM. But everything off your stock CIS setup should work in terms of ignition. Should work just fine. If you're not really messing with any of that, you shouldn't be. So that pretty much covers it in the bay. Uh, you know, like I said, remove the CIS, plug up your injector holes, loose change and some RTV, bolt on your carburetor. Um, oh yeah, add a fuel filter after and before the pump. This is just a cheap AutoZone filter works just fine i replace them once a year at most uh, you know they're like three four dollars i replace them every year now we go to the back of the car where we've got the fuel pump you cannot use your stock cis fuel pump because that puts out way too much fuel pressure you will have a bad day if you try to use it um so the trickiest part is it'll be hard to see and show you but right about there i I've got a reducer barb fitting. Um, I'll put a link below of which one you want. But basically you gotta reduce from this big old line coming off the tank down to that seven or eight mil that is the hard lines that run up to the bay. So I've found 
the easiest way is uh, cutting that stock fuel line. This comes off a big elbow and goes to your CIS pump, which will be sitting up here. I uh, use that reducer barb fitting, throw a fuel filter on, and then put on your low pressure fuel pump. And you can use uh, you use your regular wiring. You obviously have to change the connections, um, but it uses the same wiring that's used back here. So the only thing you should have to mess with is that feed line coming off the tank right there, uh, which feeds your accumulator and pump, which both sit up here. I'll put the link to this pump in the description too. It's a cheap like 20 or $30 pump, but the one thing I will say, buy two of them. Keep a spare in the car ready to go at all times because these cheap low pressure pumps uh, they're real hit or miss. Sometimes you get some that'll last you a few years. Other times you'll barely get a season out of it. Don't leave home without a spare. It's a cheap part and doesn't take up much space to keep one in the car. You only want three to four PSI for these single Webers. And that's all that that pump is good for. As I already mentioned, if you have too much fuel pressure, you're going to have a bad time. You'll overflow the carburetor with fuel and the worst case scenario, go down in a blazing glory. So as usual, this could have been a much better, more professional looking video, especially if I had the CIS in here to show you a true start to finish conversion. But I figured it's better than nothing. I don't think there's really many videos talking about this. There's plenty of forum posts. So if you're not sure or you want to read a bit more, like you should always do. Go look on Google, go on Vortex. There's stuff talking about this, plenty of threads talking about converting the carbureted. As always with, with all of these videos I'm doing, if you're not sure about something or, or if I left something out, cause I'm sure I left something out, uh, leave a comment below. Myself, along with other very helpful followers of this channel are more than glad to chime in and help where we can. Um, it's a very easy swap, I think, all in all, you could get it done for under six or seven hundred dollars. The carburetor is the most expensive part. That will cost you about five, six hundred dollars brand new. Fuel line is a few dollars. Filters are a few dollars. That fuel pump's thirty dollars. That fitting's like a dollar off of eBay from China. Um, the carburetor is the most expensive part. You could easily spend that or more on CIS and still not have it running right. So all things considered. It's, it's a viable option. I always tell people, carburetors never better than a healthy CIS. So to wrap this all up, we'll just quickly discuss, should you convert your car to carbs? I just want you to stop and ask yourself, hey, should I ditch my CIS for a carburetor? Um, generally speaking, it's not better. It can be almost as good, but it's definitely not better. So there's no, there's no short answer to that question. So hear me out if you truly care. Uh, this is going to be a little long-winded, but um, within the last few years, five or ten years, I forget exactly when, the gasoline in the United States started having ethanol, more and more ethanol added to it. What does this mean? Well, basically this new gasoline, this newer ethanol gasoline, does not store well. Um, it crystallizes and turns all nasty and, and absolutely wrecks havoc on CIS and carburetors. So uh, this isn't going to, you know, switching to a carburetor isn't going to uh, fix your ethanol concerns. If a, one of these cars has been sitting with that ethanol fuel in it, sitting in that CIS fuel distributor, you're going to have a bad time. If, if you get a car that's been sitting and you throw some new gas in it and it starts up great, runs fine, great leave the cis alone but as these cars get older the fuel system's not going to hold up as well and even if you can find good healthy parts they add up quick and then if those parts fail then what a healthy cis fuel system is going to be better than a carburetor nine times out of ten the that other one out of ten times where cis is going to hold you back is extreme performance scenario. So if you're talking monster cam, big port work on the head, that sort of stuff, you're gonna have trouble getting CIS to run right. I know a few people who can get the CIS to run well with very aggressive race-oriented motor builds, but at that point, you're gonna wanna look into uh, 
race carbs, or better yet, ITVs, individual throttle bodies. That's a whole nother can of worms though, so we won't even go there. I like carburetors. I've been working with them since I was like eight years old on dirt bikes. Uh, they're pretty, they're pretty easy once you once you learn them. It's a little overwhelming at first with tuning them. Uh, if any of you are getting to that point and you need help, like I said, just leave a message below, uh, and we'll get I'll get in touch with you, and we'll, I'll try my best to walk you through that. But tuning carburetors, working on them, rebuilding them, uh, driving them. Not that bad. Uh, I think it's definitely better and less stressful than a shitty CIS that will leave you stranded or with an unusable car. So, uh, you know, these single 32, 36 Webers, you can buy them right off the shelf. That's a great thing about them. The rebuild kits are 30 bucks, something like that off of eBay. The jets are pretty easy to get. Um, they are a bit involved when it comes to fine tuning them. So, my best piece of advice, buy one brand new off the shelf, one that's for these motors. I'll leave, a dis I'll leave a link below, the exact one that I'm talking about, but they do make these carburetors specific for Volkswagen 8 valve, 1.8, 1.6 liters, 1.7 liters. I've bought them used and they've been a bit of a headache because, uh, you know, buying one from somebody down south in a warmer climate, trying to get it on a totally different motor that has more work or less work done to it you know that's when it becomes a bit of a of a headache so new is always best it's pricey but again it's a nice peace of mind knowing that you can now drive that car across the country without any fueling issues all four mark one sitting in my driveway have carburetors but I still am not quick to tell people just convert it to carbs. There's very few instances where I say, yes, a carburetor is definitely going to be easier and cheaper to deal with. Without rambling too much, that should wrap it all up. If there are any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, and uh, yeah, see you guys later.